This week on Talking Real, we're joined by Josh Cockroft for another legislative update. A lot of deadlines have passed, and we've got news for you. The latest updates right now with Josh. Welcome back to Talking Real, brought to you by the Oklahoma Association of Realtors. This is episode 161 of Talking Real, and we're here in the studio with, of course, my good friend, Nabil. Nabil, how are you? I'm doing well, Jeff. It's it's another day. (laughs) (laughs) He's doing well, but it's another day. That's, hey, you know, sometimes that's the best we can hope for. That's the week before conference. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, Speaking of, we're also joined here by... Sleepy Josh Cockroft. Sleepy. <laughs> wow. He's been spending so much time at the Capitol, late nights at the Capitol, that, man, he's just been uh, having to work a lot of extra time at for least you. I, at least I'm not like Neil in, in, in my cave back here with all of his videos and hey, slides. Hey, hey, you know everyone likes spending time in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, if you're not aware, we have, and if you listen to us, you should be aware by now that we've got Capitol Conference coming up next week. And I don't know, is it too late to sign up or can they still sign up, Josh? You can still sign up. Uh, this year pivoting to a virtual event we're pretty much keeping registration open until the end Um, so make sure you get that in uh, March 30th 31st and April 1st we're really excited and have a lot of great content this year so looking forward to it yeah it's gonna be fun and we'll talk more about that in a little bit oh foreshadowing I know we should right (laughs) yeah I mean you can't just give them give it I was ready to go I was like we kind of keep people on the edge of their seats yeah teaser Hopefully not while they're driving, though. Yes, be careful. So we brought Josh back in because we want to have another update on the legislative session. A lot has transpired in the last however many weeks. It's probably been three or four weeks since we had him on last. And so we want to give you an update of what's going on out at the Capitol because a lot has changed. It's been yeah. hit a couple deadlines and yeah. all that. So, Josh, uh, where do you want to start? Well, let's start kind of with where we are right now, and that is we're in a holding pattern um, <laughs> currently. <laughs> Uh, you know, last week being spring break, legislature normally takes uh, at least a few days off f- over the spring break. And that's because deadline week to get everything out of the House of Origin uh, was the week before that. So lots of late nights spent. They spent last week uh, kind of tuned back on the on the schedule aspect. And then this week it's starting to ramp up a little bit. But uh, all the bills that came from the House over to the Senate and vice versa, having to get assigned to the the, uh, the committees. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of a hurry up and wait right now. Not a whole lot being done on the floor, but committee work is starting to fire up again. So Now, you said a, a couple late nights. Now, the, the rumor I heard was that they had at least one night where they had to suspend the rules and go till 1 o'clock in the morning. Is that? Yeah. So <laughs> unlike Washington, D.C. that does not have this rule, Oklahoma, actually, they have to adjourn by midnight. Uh, based on House and Senate rules, and uh, they can't reconvene until at least eight o'clock the next morning. So that's that's in both of the chambers' rules. They did have one night last week where there was extensive debate on a bill that it became very obvious that they were going to go past midnight, and so they actually suspended that rule in the House. Senate never went past midnight, uh, but. Uh, the House suspended that rule, and they went till about one, one fifteen, one morning. So that in that week, two weeks ago, there were uh, almost every night the legislature was in until very late in the evening. Wow, good that's times. A, yeah, that's a that's a late night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad I don't have to work that late. Yeah, I would be very grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't become a lobbyist. Then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so a little bit of a holding pattern now, but um, to me, what I hear when you say that based on this past deadline and all that is that it's really just the work will be coming and more late nights will be coming. Is that, is yeah. that an accurate assessment? Yeah. I mean, think of it as a roller coaster. You kind of tick up the hill, you know, on that initial incline. And now we've hit that plateau at the top and it's going to be straight down <laughs> from from here on out. Uh, so it's going to it's going to pick up quickly. You're going to have the appropriations process as they start to really dig into the state budget process. 
uh, for the next several uh, weeks and months and on top of all the policy that's still going. So we started out with about 3,100 bills that were introduced this year. We're down to about 900 that have gone through both the House and the Senate. You'll see a drop off of probably 50 to 100 more by the time things are done uh, through this committee process. So they have four weeks for committee at the beginning of session. They've got two weeks of floor work, which is what we just went through. And now they're in four more weeks of committee. And then the rest of the way committees are done and it's all floor work. So looking at about 900 bills at this point as we go. So from our from our standpoint, we started the year tracking about 230 bills. We're down to about approximately 50. Oh. So that that first floor deadline two weeks ago, that is a glorious, amazing day <laughs> because that means a lot of bills die uh, and are not eligible to be heard. The rest of the session, if they don't get out of committee and aren't heard on the, the floor of the House of Origin, uh, you don't have to worry about them for, for this session. That does not mean that their language couldn't be snuck into something else. So you just kind of have to watch it a little bit, but the workload dramatically decreases at that point. Perfect. It's like, you don't have, you don't need to watch that many more bills, but the ones you're watching, you need to watch even that much closer. Exactly. Yeah. Because, uh, the, even stuff that, that is not necessarily in, involving real estate, if it's in the same, same title of law, it can still be amended to put old language in uh, language that even uh, failed in in depending on what the chamber rules are. House and Senate rules are a little bit different on how they can do this, but if you know a measure failed early in the process, they can actually sometimes bring that language back and put it into a completely different bill as long as it's in the title of laws, as long as it has some uh, something to do with that subject area. Mm then yeah, you got to watch it. That's nice. Yeah. It's, it's very kind of them. <laughs> it's, so. You mentioned the budget process. I'm kind of curious. How's, how's that looking? I, I feel pessimistic about it, but I don't know. Is it looking okay? We're, we're dealing with a little bit of a surplus this year, but you have, there's always an asterisk by that this year because we had such a dramatic decrease last year. So if you're looking at it as far as total spending year over year that the legislature has been doing over the last couple of years, it's going to be a decrease over what would traditionally be done. But revenue has been much better than was expected, a couple hundred million dollars more than what was expected. The Oklahoma economy has roared back to life after the COVID shutdown last year. And so uh, it, it's legislators are actually very optimistic about what the picture looks like this year. It's just not going to be as great as it could be. Uh, but that process, it's actually pretty slow right now. There's not a whole lot of outward facing work being done. There's no committee meetings uh, that are dealing specifically with the budget. That does not mean that those meetings are, are not happening behind the scenes between the chairman of the House and Senate and the governor's office. Those negotiations are ongoing throughout the entire session. So it'll take a while. Probably, you know, traditionally the, the budget's passed within the last week of session at the end of May. So it'll just, it, it'll kind of snowball as it goes forward. We'll start seeing some, some more work that's being done. I've got to stay close to the deadlines. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You had mentioned that there's about 900 bills left. Is that typical for a year or is this more or less? Than it you varies. Usually see? Yeah, it varies. You know, as far as what was filed this year, that was the most in state history that had been filed. Um, hmm. The reason for that is not necessarily because legislators had all of these great ideas. A lot, <laughs> a lot of um, a lot of that is just due to a lot of refiles from last year because almost nothing was heard. Right. And so you're seeing a lot of identical bills that were in the last two legislatures, legislative years, the last legislature that were just simply refiled as the exact same bill or just slightly tweaked this year. So getting to this point in the process, it's about on par uh, as far as what you see, as far as a ratio of what bills go all the way through. Mm. But uh, it, it, it does vary from year to year. Nice. I was just, this is a question of curiosity. Well, let's get curious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so bills that aren't heard can get refiled the next year. So, yeah, kind of. 
Yes okay. and no. Okay. Yes and no. So my curiosity goes a little <laughs> deeper, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> two, we're on a two year cycle. So okay. uh, this is the first year of the 58th legislature. Next year will be the second year of the 58th legislature. And then the legislature starts over with the 59th legislature. So any bill that's filed this year in the first year is eligible to be heard next year. So okay. as long as you're in the first, if you're in the second year of a two year cycle, the stuff that was filed the year prior, you're eligible to hear again. Okay. And part two. Well, that that actually opened up another question too. <laughs> We're getting educated today. Uh, so, okay, so if a bill was filed the first year, it is eligible to be heard the second. Year. The second year. Mm -hmm. What if it was heard the first year? Can you still get it heard again the second year? Like try again? Yeah, uh, if it's somewhere in the pro, it, it doesn't matter where it is in the process as long as it hasn't failed. Okay. If, it, if it has failed, say it's a House bill introduced in the House, passes through committee, uh, goes onto the House floor, and it fails on the floor, then it's dead. It's dead. And it's then you dead. gotta, you gotta, you could maybe bring it back, but you gotta do a whole new bill. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you, you would have to find another vehicle to place it in so that it, that language could continue to be worked on. Again, this is really getting to the weeds here, but. <laughs> <laughs> but there there are different rules between the House and Senate. So House is a little bit more strict on what can and can't be used if a bill has failed. So uh, they get a little sticky. You know, the situation gets a little sticky sometimes if you have identical language just being tried to put in a completely other bill because they'll go, no, that language failed mm, in see. this other bill. Okay. So there are some specific rules in the House. Senate, it's basically open season wherever you can put language you can you can try it again plagiarize as much as you want <laughs> <That's right. laughs> That's okay right. so then <laughs> <laughs> down the rabbit hole we go so you file the first year or you say you can you can probably file the second year as well it didn't get heard at all can you just take that same thing and put it again in the 59th legislature Yes, but it would be a brand new bill number. Okay. Uh, so you can have the exact same language. I mean, there, there were many times when I was in the legislature that I filed the exact same thing four times. Why weren't you getting it passed? Yeah, it was, apparently, it <laughs> apparently, it wasn't that great of an idea. Um, but yeah, you can keep refiling. Okay. It's just going to be a different bill number because the bill numbers are assigned based on when you get your request in. So you know, if I, I if you get the the language filed in a bill. Earlier in the process, it's going to have a lower bill number. So. I wonder if there's a ratio to the number of refilings to the ratio of success. Low. Well. Low. <laughs> low. Really low. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so. this bill just keeps popping up. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's some of those perennial that just come every year. So are we out of the rabbit hole? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. Let's talk about wholesaling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Let's get actually talk policy. Not, <laughs> not rabbit holes. Um, that was educational, though. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Wholesaling. So House Bill 1148, a measure that we've been working on with OREC for the last really three years now, uh, was successful in the House of Representatives. So it passed out a committee in the House Rules Committee unanimously, passed off of the House floor 91 to 9. Uh, so overwhelming support in the House. Right now it's going over to the Senate, or it's in the Senate, and Senator Racino uh, has, uh, we'll probably next week we'll have a committee hearing on that, but things are moving very quickly and very smoothly on that. So we're really encouraged about that, you know, from the, the feedback that we got from members and on the house side, it was extremely positive as evidenced by the vote total, but, uh, a lot of really good questions being asked, uh, nothing, no, no questions on the floor, no debate or anything. It, it sailed through, but a lot of discussions were had before that vote took place, uh, just with one-on-one -on -one meetings and phone calls and emails. So very excited, um, very hopeful that we'll continue to see see that success in the Senate. So Representative Osborne and Senator Racino have done a fantastic job for us. That's great. Yeah, I know our members are going to be excited to see that. This is something that for as long as I've been working for OAR, you know, we've been talking about this. So this is something that's been a number of years in the making as we've gathered information, we've started having those discussions, we've been working with the Real Estate Commission, and now we're finally at that point where we're pushing that bill forward. And so I think that's 
That's great. And it's a testament to that idea that like things don't always happen in just one year. Like right. let's just go file a bill and get get done what we want done. It's not always that easy. Right. In fact, we've seen that in the past with like home buyer savings yep. and all these kinds of things that we deal with. It's a multi year process sometimes. Just it, as you were talking about yeah. filing a bill, maybe it doesn't get heard. Oh, yeah. And refiling and all that. And the other thing I would say <clears> is <throat> some of the questions we've gotten from realtor members is we have to be careful on, on our expectations going forward and we're hopeful that it passes. But what I mean by that is, you know, this policy and saying that you, if you're going to publicly market an equitable interest in a property, you have to hold a real estate license in the state of Oklahoma. That is not going to cure the problem overnight. Um, back kind of what you're saying, it's, it's, it's just not going to stop overnight. And we realize that it's not the, the end all be all, end of the conversation on real estate wholesaling for the state of Oklahoma. However, it's step one. And we haven't, I mean, up to this point, we haven't even taken that step. And that's been OREC's frustration is there's there there were no guidelines that they had based on state statute, anything they could do through administrative rules that could help com, uh, combat some of the, the problems that they are seeing, that we're seeing, our members are seeing. So, this is step one. I would fully expect in the next couple of years that there are going to have to be follow up policies that we work on with OREC, with the legislature to continue to address the problem because just the, the, the overall, the overall nature of real estate wholesaling is there are loopholes. And so we've got to figure out what that looks like. And that happens no matter, it's not just on this issue, it happens on every issue. That's what the legislature does. It's not like they're sitting around passing a brand new law after brand new law. It's little tweaks and changes based off of experience they're seeing in their districts, constituents bringing requests, uh, groups like us, we're bringing requests. There's, there's little things that have to happen as we go through, and it's not just an overnight fix. For sure. Right, because you can't plan for every eventuality no. from no. the get-go. Yeah. yeah. What are some other policy issues going on out there that realtors might be interested in? Well, uh, I know we've talked before a little bit about uh, Senate Bill 277. That's the measure that dealt with property registries. Mm. Um, that also uh, Was this the Municipal through, League bill that yeah, we so, talked about on the previous episode? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've been working over the last year with the Municipal League on an issue that we worked on back in 2014. <clears throat> Uh, we basically passed the measure in 2014 that said uh, a municipality cannot create a registry uh, for tracking individuals in their in their municipalities, can't collect information, can't impose a fee for collecting information. It's fairly restrictive, and you know, our association was doing that from a property uh, private property rights perspective. The municipal league has has tried multiple times over the years to to pull that back, and it's something that we have fought uh, and have disagreed with their group on. Um, but we really struck up a conversation this past year of okay, look, is there a middle ground here that we can try to, to come to an agreement? So we worked out the language that is currently in Senate Bill two seventy seven, passed out of that the Senate is in the House now, that said that uh, information can be collected by the municipalities if and only if, again, no fee can can be uh, levied against the collection of that information. And two, that information is 100% confidential, not open to any open records requests, uh, can't be shared with any other groups or individuals. And they're coming at it from the standpoint of, we have to have the ability to address abatement issues and dilapidated properties that are just causing blight in mm -hmm. our municipalities. We were coming at it from, hey, private property rights, you know, you, each individual needs to be secure in their own dwelling, that, that, kind of in, uh, th that kind of direction. So we came to the middle and said, okay, if you do collect the information, here are the stipulations. And so came to the agreed upon language. Like I said, it's gone through the Senate and is now in the House awaiting a committee hearing over there. So that's that's positive. That's great. Yeah. Um, it, just just a few other detail. I mean, issues that really went through on the detail uh, on the deadline week. Legislature spent a lot of time talking about taxes. Uh, there's quite a few tax reforms that are slowly making their way through the process. Speaker McCall uh, worked uh, with several individuals in his caucus 
and they got passed off of the the house floor some some proposals for personal income tax uh, credits as well as corporate income tax credits they're viewing it from a a recruitment aspect for business and industry to come into Oklahoma uh, in light of what a lot of other states, including surrounding states, are doing right now and the atmospheres that they have in those states. So looking at a lower tax burden uh, for for those states. Um, it, just, it makes me laugh because I remember a few years back when I was doing more work at the legislature and like Re- repealing tax credits was like the hot topic at the time, and now we're talking <laughs> everything's <laughs> cyclical. It's just funny. It is. You know? It is. It, and but it's interesting for me uh, watching their approach this time because you know the Republican caucus is obviously the caucus of wanting to reduce tax burdens. I mean that's that's a core that's a core principle or a core platform issue. And so they've been pushing for that. They have a supermajority. They have, you know, they, they've succeeded at that in years past. Uh, but the hurdle has been the three fourths majority to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. If Mm -hmm. taxes are lower, I mean, if, if there's a need to raise taxes, um, and, and so they've, they've gotten really creative this year. And in, in my perspective, they got very creative in saying that, you know what, we're not just going to unilaterally lower the overall tax rate. We're just going to impose tax credits that can be adjusted later on just by a simple majority vote. Much better way mm-hmm. to do it. Yeah. So it gives you, it gives the state the ability in a bad year, like we've had in the past to say, eh, this is the year that we need some more tax revenue from the individuals, from the corporations in the state of Oklahoma. But here we are with the three quarters majority. We can't pass a tax increase. So this way, they have the ability in those bad years to say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna kind of roll back that credit a little bit this year," and they can do that by simple majority vote. Yeah, so a lot more flexibility. There is a ton. Yeah. There's a lot more flexibility um, having served through the legislature that had to, to look at, you know, raising some taxes in 2017, 2018, it was a mon. I, I don't, I still don't know how it, it was amazing. Finally went through because yeah. the amount of numbers that you have to have, it's just, it's, it's difficult to do. So, um, taxes, education was also a, a huge issue that was discussed. There's an open transfer bill that's being discussed by the, by the speaker. It's being driven by the speaker in the house as well as Senator, uh, Senator Pugh uh, and Senator Taylor in the in the uh, uh, in the Senate. Sorry, I couldn't remember what that other <laughs> chamber was called for a second. Like you said, I'm sleepy. Um, uh, some some funding uh, on some funding changes on where dollars go in the individual school districts based on where that child is going. Right now, there's there's a uh, the, the way they calculate like how much money per student goes to a school district is on a three year rolling average, and the measure that they po- that that they're proposing at this point is to put that on a one year rolling average so that if there are transfers within that year, the money follows the student mm. instead mm. of staying with the school. Um, so I mean, tons of debate, and I'm not going to get into that issue. I'm just giving the update here. Don't don't hate me. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a ton of debate around education policy with the open transfer issue. There's a ton of discussion on the funding side as well, but uh, that took up a lot of time. That's actually the measure that took them until 1 a.m. Ah, two weeks ah, that makes ago. sense. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Obviously, a lot going on, and that's just a little bit and piece of it. Uh, I mean, it's been an enlightening episode. We've got a lot of questions from Nabil answered on the process, <laughs> which I think is great. Like these are questions that people probably have that we forget that you know maybe take for take advantage if we kind of know how that process works. So I'm glad we could go into that. It's good to have a capital noob on the podcast, huh? <laughs> <laughs> as well as a good update on what we got going on. From a policy standpoint, so Josh, I always appreciate you coming and sharing that knowledge. Um, It's always very enlightening to see what's going on. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, point of honesty here, you know, I wasn't totally into this process before I started working here. Mm. And then working alongside you all that are super politically inclined. But you explained it so well that I'm like, all right, this is interesting. I see why people are into this, you know, because sometimes people just don't explain it really well. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Absolutely. Either yeah. we're politically inclined or we fake it till we make it. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of me and probably the members. There you go. <laughs> well, Nabil, what do we need to do to close this episode out? Well, we promised a little yeah. Capcom. Capcom. So... Tell us about Capcom. Yeah, Mar- March 30th. <laughs> I'll go quickly here. March 30th, March 31st, and April 1st. We're really excited. Uh, make sure to register at okrealtors.com forward slash capital conference. That Tuesday, that's March 30th, we have a jam-packed schedule of some incredible speakers. We had the opportunity to sit down with a bunch of legislative leaders as, w- as well as executive uh, branch leaders. Uh, we've got a fantastic keynote speaker, Kim Lear, that's coming in to talk about uh, engaging a, a evolving workforce. We've had the opportunity to hear a few of us here on staff to, to hear her before with some other groups, and she is absolutely fantastic. You're not going to want to miss that. We have an update from NAR. We have a live talking reel uh, that day with uh, Grant Cody, the executive director of OREC. Uh, and, and a whole lot more. And then we're, we're hoping the next two days, March 31st and April 1st, we're going to be able to hold some town hall meetings with legislators based on where you are in the state that be able to meet with some individuals virtually that serve your areas of the state. A little bit of a disclaimer with that is we are still not sure. We're still trying to work out scheduling on all of that. We have it scheduled right now that we're going to that these town hall meetings are are going to happen. But the legislature has changed some scheduling things on their end. So we're not really sure as far as availability, much more details to come on that. Uh, But it's going to be a fantastic event. We're excited. And and that's always the tricky part of things, right? Like even when we're scheduling these pre meetings. Right. We were running into that. So exactly. Well, check that out. Get signed up. OKRealtors.com forward slash capital conference. It's going to be a good time. It really is. Otherwise, we appreciate you listening to us every single week when you come back here to Talking Real. If you've got any feedback for us or since we're going to be having a live Talking Real with the OREC executive director, if you've got any questions you'd like us to ask, email those to us to podcast at OKRealtors.com. And they could just be curiosity questions or rabbit hole questions, you know. <laughs> just just go with your gut. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. And, and if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button so you know when the next episode is out and share this podcast with a fellow real estate enthusiast. There you go. And until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday on Talking Real.